Okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon where you are joining us from. Welcome to the NASA Earth Data webinar, Discover and Use NASA Physical Oceanography Data. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. Most of you have already seen this, but while we're logging in, we'd appreciate your feedback on the two optional polls at the bottom and middle portion of the page. I do have 2 p.m. Eastern time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. First, what I'd like to begin is with is to go over just a few housekeeping items related to this webinar. To ensure best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. If you have any issues or any questions, what I'd like for you to do is to enter those into the Q&A pod, and you'll see that in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, so right here. Okay, that works like a chat. This webinar will be recorded. It'll be posted both to our NASA Online Adobe Connect event catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. These URLs will be provided to you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download. The webinar itself is one hour long. 45 minutes are allocated to the presentation and demonstrations with another 15 minutes for the Q&A period. So after our speakers have finished their presentations, we will then move to the final set of polling questions. As mentioned earlier, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout, and you should use the Q&A pod to do so. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. We will take all questions using the Q&A pod at the end of the webinar. What I'd like to do next is move to our agenda and also our speaker introduction. Our first speaker today is Michelle Girock, who is the NASA Physical Oceanography Distributed Active Archive Center, or PODAC, project scientist. She will start by providing an introduction to NASA PODAC and provide an overview of the physical oceanography data holdings. We will then transition to our second speaker today, Jessica Hausman, who is a data engineer at the NASA PODAC. Her focus is in ocean altimetry, gravity, and ocean currents. She will lead us through a brief tour of the PODAC website and also conduct a series of data discovery, visualization, and subsetting demonstrations. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Michelle Girock. Michelle? Thanks, Jennifer. So um, as Jennifer mentioned, what I'm going to provide first and foremost is a, more of a high-level overview of what PODAC is. Maybe some of you might be confused as to what a DAC is, and I'll give a real general uh, overview of that. But more so, again, this focus is about PODAC. So what PODAC is, what PODAC's data holdings are, and what are some of the tools and services that we provide to give you, the users, the data in an easy, accessible way. So with that, um, within the continental US, there are uh, 12 data centers, as you're seeing here, or DACs. Um, each one has a specific discipline, whether it's LP DAC that has, uh, specializes here, as you can see, in land processes and features, or let's say OB DAC, which is mainly focuses on ocean biology and biogeochemistry. The main point of DACs is to bridge mission operations to science operations and then end up with you all, the users. So just to take you through the schematic, Basically, from the spacecraft itself, the data goes to the ground stations, which then go to sort of these processing centers. And some of the, the DACs actually serve as these processing centers, whereas others do not. Regardless, the data ends up with the DAC, and it is the DACs that are the long-term archive. So it is the DAC's responsibility as a long-term archive for the satellite products themselves to provide the accurate metadata, documentation, and again, tools and services to provide that data to you all, the users. So of those 12 DACs, PODAC is one of them, and we specialize in physical oceanography data. So what exactly that means within this umbrella of physical oceanography, we have multiple disciplines, if you will, or parameters. So gravity, ocean circulation and currents ocean surface salinity, ocean surface topography, which some of you might know as sea level, ocean vector winds, sea surface temperature, and then we have two that are grayed out. These are not our main parameters. These are actually parameters that other DACs specialize in, but we have some products that they also use, so we show our interoperability between sort of the DACs in the continental US. 
So from these specific parameters, the missions um, and projects are above, which are related to these parameters themselves. So whether you have CSAT, Topax, Poseidon, JSON-1, JSON-2, which are all ocean surface topography missions, or NSCAT, Sea Winds, QuickScat, which are all ocean vector winds, GRACE, which is gravity, GRIST, which is sea surface temperature. It's a consortium of sea surface temperature products. Aquarius being um, our sea surface salinity satellite that we um, had and fortunately has now um, become inactive. But we also do, aside from satellite, we also have field data or in situ. That's a recent sort of thing that we've been now highlighting within Podax. So our first sort of sample was SPURS. SPURS was a field campaign in the North Atlantic to understand the processes for the salinity maximum that we were seeing from Aquarius. So we actually do have in situ data as well as satellite. Um, another one that we'll be having um, coming up soon is something called OMG. OMG is an Earth Venture Suborbital Mission from NASA. So it is both airborne and in situ. And we will be having that coming up soon. But we also have, aside from in situ and satellite, we also have airborne. So I mean, some of these things you may not, may not even be aware of. So AirSWAT is an airborne campaign that we have, which is a precursor to an upcoming satellite mission called SWAT, as you can see here in 2020. SWAT does surface water ocean topography. So AirSWAT is the precursor providing high resolution uh, airborne remote sensing data. So that is Podak in a nutshell as to what our data holdings are, what sort of things we have. And what we try and do then with regards to those different data products is have these three main thrust areas. It's data management and stewardship. So making sure we, again, are the long-term archive for those missions and projects that you saw, providing with you uh, accurate documentation, metadata, read software. That's all part of our data management and stewardship, as well as providing sort of the, per the people behind it. So you can always come to us and ask us queries. And Jessica will be talking about that later. Jessica is actually one of our data engineers. So she will answer questions related to ocean surface topography and gravity. And we have people for each specific discipline. So you always have someone you can ask your questions to. Um, another area that we focus upon is data access. So it's great we have these amazing data products, but how do we make it accessible to you? And Jessica will be providing in the next sort of installment all about data access. What are the tools and services and capabilities that we have to make the data accessible to you, the users? And last but not least, science information services. So you can consider this sort of our social media outlet. Um, we have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, but also too we have an amazing forum in which you can basically come to us and again ask any question which gets redirected to a data engineer or you can contact us directly on our um, email address. But to we also try and illustrate, we do have all these amazing products. In fact, we have over 600 data sets, um, which can get a little you know, overwhelming. So we try and highlight specific current events that are happening in the ocean and the utilization of those uh, events, if you will, using our data sets. So we have these things that we call monthly ocean stories. A recent one we just did is basically how we're using NASA physical oceanography products to understand the developing El Nino conditions in the eastern equatorial Pacific. So we try and also give you some content behind those data sets as well and how you can use them. Um, so without further ado, that was sort of my high-level summary. And now I'm going to pass it off to Jessica Hausman. Again, as I mentioned, Jessica is one of our amazing Podak data engineers who specializes in uh, ocean surface topography and gravity, and she's going to mainly be talking with you all about, again, data access, what tools and services we have to make data accessible to you. Jessica? Thanks, Michelle. So I'm going to provide all the uh, demos for several of our tools and services here at Podax, and we'll basically break them up into several different categories. Basically, we have our um, Web portal. The web portal is the first thing you would come to typically as a user at Podak to either search for a data set, search for content that we might announce through uh, emails or through Facebook, uh, our data set highlights, which are when new data sets come out. We give little um, promos about what's unique about that. Uh, and basically, it's, it's your one place to come to you know, kind of discover everything. Uh, next, we'll talk about the protocols. The protocols are exactly are how you access the data, the direct link into the data from Podak. Then we'll talk about visualizations. So how do you uh, 
um, look at the data without actually having to download it locally. And we'll also talk about how to subset the data as well at Podak. Okay. So first, we'll start the demo for the web portal, Podak. And so here you should be able to see, this of course is Podak. There's our uh, website right there, podak.jpl.nasa.gov. And here is the biggest thing you can see, of course, is our rotator, which also acts as our search, access, visualization, and help. So here you get the latest news. Uh, you can see how many new news tidbits are there with the circles. Uh, and so you get uh, news from the announcements, what we're doing, current events, events that we're at. Uh, data set highlights our ocean stories, which you can also find in this bottom box here. So you can also tab through this and find out um, ocean stories are typically current events that we try to um, let users know how our data can be used to study such phenomena, such as the current El Nino that's going on. And then, of course, data set highlights, as I mentioned before, when new data sets come in, we like to let the users know about it and kind of what makes it unique. You will also find um, announcements. If you're not already on our email list, these are the announcements that are sent out. And of course, you can always subscribe to our email list on the bottom here on the link. Uh, and we also have events. So you'll find us at Ocean Sciences if you want to come and ask us any questions, um, various other meetings, and also when we have downtime. Um, at Podak because we have to do run maintenance or something like that. Okay, and um, so you can of course come here to search for data. Obviously, so we have a search field here. We also you can also search directly for web content instead. Um, there are two different options if you want to go directly into the search field. We also have the data discovery through our various tabs on the top. So here you can do by parameter collection platform, which is typically a satellite uh, sensor or instrument. Um, most useful tab is probably the data access, which has lists all of the different protocols along with different tools that we'll, I'll be demoing as well later today. Um, measurements, so basically an overview of all the parameters that we support at Hodak, along with the different satellite missions. And then we also have multimedia, which would be the animations or images um, I do suggest that you look at the animations because there are actually some really nice um, uh, little, some are cartoons and some are actually from, direct from the data that we have. Um, so it actually makes really nice demos if you're a teacher or a professor and you need to want to uh, display a concept. Um, community and of course the forum. So let's say you want and, and try to search everything and you still can't find what you want. Uh, we suggest that you try going to the forum or of course there's always our help desk. So let's say you're coming into Podak and Hurricane Patricia was a couple of weeks ago. And you're wanting to see what the wind intensity and all the pro uh, for Hurricane Patricia was. So let's search for winds. So of course you can go through data discovery and go through parameter. There's also this search option which gives you the same. So here you see parameter. And then also you see these little icons for tables on the right hand side. The little tables will give you an overview of all the data sets. So here you can see there's 85 wind data sets. And then the table will also give you just a quick summary of the data sets available, temporal resolution, spatial, start time, process level refers to level 2, level 3, level 4. Level 2 is the long track swath data. Level 3 and 4 are the gridded data. And then data format as well. So this is one way of um, uh, having a nice condensed version of information. And of course, you can always, we also have a faceted search option as well. So I know I want to search for winds, so click on winds. And then on the left-hand side, you see various filters for which you can um, filter down your data. We call these facets. And so I know that um, for winds, I kind of want a near real-time product, only because sometimes the research quality, historical quality data can take up to a month. Depends on the data set. So I'm going to say near real-time data. So now my 85 data sets now come down to four data sets. Much more manageable. So I will choose this um, ASCAT level two. And so this is so that was the summary of the four data sets available for winds in near real time. 
And now I get what we call a data set information page. So the data set information page is um, a summary of what the data set is about. So here you see the description. We now have DOIs. Some of our data sets have DOIs. More of the historical research grade data sets are the ones that have registered DOIs right now. And part of that was um, provenance for the data sets and also the help of citations, as some journals now require you to cite the data that you use. And of course, there's a citation tab where you can copy and paste a citation. So here you have the description, along with the spatial resolution, coverage, and of course, documentation and data access, which I think is what everyone would really like to know about, because it's nice to know that the data exists, but you really need to get to it. Okay? So now we know that ASCAD exists and that we're interested in this data set, let's go and look at what some of the protocols are that we can use for this. So there are several protocols that we offer at PODAC, as you can see highlighted on the top here. So these include FTP. I think FTP is probably going to be very familiar with uh, most users. It's uh, been around for years. There's OpenDAP, which actually allows you for, to do subsetting. We have our level two along track data along with our level three, level four gridded data in OpenDAP. Next is Threads. Threads um, does allow you to do subsetting and aggregates as well, but only our level three and four data are available within Threads. And also we have Web Services, which is kind of our homegrown um, protocol that we've made at Podak that levies machine-to-machine -machine interfaces. So basically, um, you can code your um, data subset, and you can also do a search and um, imaging from this as well. So we'll start the web service demo. And as I said, this is a nice machine-to-machine -machine way to um, access data, an ooze or something like that and you want to supplement satellite data into your own local data center. You can do this through um, web services. So here we'll go back to, here's our ASCAT. We'll just click on the web services. And here you can see are the various web services here. Um, these are basically the data sets that you can subset uh, through the web services. So you can see there's quite a few. And also, let's say we didn't start from ASCAT, you can always go back to the web, to the data access and get to the data set that way, or get to the web services that way, along with all of our other tools and protocols. So here you can see web services works for data set metadata, granular metadata, uh, search for data sets. So of course, like if you know what instrument you want um, or parameter, you can do it that way. And for PODAC, what we refer to granules are basically files. Um, so when you see granule metadata, granule search, it means that you've identified a data set that you're interested in already, and now you're getting into the individual files of that data set. And then there's also, uh, you can image the granule and then also do an extract with a subset. Okay? So we'll go back to looking at what... So now that we've identified the data set already, we went straight to the search for granules, of course. So since we did it straight from the data set info page, it already comes pre-populated with the data set ID. You could also use the data set short name. And of course, there's examples. And also so you know what the format is for the fields that we expect to see. And for the bounding box, you can always click on the link. And here it says bounding box, and that gives you the format. So it is. Um, so here you can see the bounding box should be given as west, south, east, north. Okay. So I have already pre-populated a scat for the time frame and uh, geographical location of the hurricane. So you can see uh, it was October 23rd. And then there's also various other options you can choose from as well, such as the format, um, how many items per page, and such. So we just hit run. And here you see that there are several granules, I think this is about seven, that correspond to the time and space that I gave it. And you can see there are multiple links here. So here you can see 
a quick look image of that granule, which will pop up. Typically, you would see an image here. Let's try this one. I think our connection is just a little bit slow. There we go. So here you can see this is what that granule looks like over the area. And of course, you have pieces missing because there's land there. You also have uh, the data extract, so you can choose NetCDF format or HDF. Uh, you can get the OpenDAP link as well. And then this also contains all the subsetted information in the OpenDAP link. Um, and of course, various flavors of metadata, which um, is definitely uh, an important aspect because now you understand what the data is trying to tell you. This is an XML format, which is a very machine-readable format, and you can kind of glimpse from the information what's in there as well. Okay, so that was our web service demo. So now we'll talk about the next section, um, which will be protocol, or SOTO. Visualizations now. So with visualizations, we have two types of visualizers. One is SOTO, which is state of the ocean, which is a near real-time visualizer. It shows the latest 30 days of data. And then also we have an Aquarius uh, level three, which is, the, of course, the grids browser. So I will do a demo of the um, SOTO 2D. So as I said, SOTO 2D is, has the latest 30 days of data. So it's also a great way to see, maybe you just want to find out what the beach conditions are. It's great for that. You want to see, you know, you have a favorite tropical instability wave in the tropics that you like viewing as well. Uh, you can use it for that as well. So here I have pre-set up a demo uh, focusing on Hurricane Patricia. So here you have satellite layers. So you can see I picked three data sets for this. One is wind speed, uh, wind vectors, and modus true color. So of course the clouds you here you see come from modus true color. The wind vectors are the arrows. And so on the right-hand side here are actually your various layers. So for vectors, you can choose black arrows, white arrows. You can also change how big the arrows are. Um, so you can see I've got, I can increase the size or decrease it. And then other nice thing is that you can actually switch these layers around. So you can decide what's going to be on top and what's going to be on bottom. And we also have uh, transparencies as well. So this opacity here. So you can see I have vector winds, then the col modus color, and then we also have ocean speed, or I'm sorry, wind, the ocean surface wind speed, which we can play around with the opacity. So if I ch weaken the opacity of modus, and there we go. Now we have wind speed that is now visible. So you can see. Here where the vectors are a bit thicker, or I'm sorry, are larger. And I will make them thicker so you can view it a little bit easier. We see kind of that red spot from Hurricane Patricia. And as you can see, this is for October 23rd. And you can always go and check if data is available by going hovering over the calendar icon. And it then highlights the dates the data are available for. OK, so let's say well, it looks like there's several storms out there, and I'm not really sure which one Hurricane Patricia is. That's OK, because we have other layers that we um, pull from other sources. And you can see one of them is ocean storms. And here, you can see the intensity of the storms. There's also a time toggle down here. So I'll just have it start on October 20th. And here you can see Hurricane Patricia. And you see the little dots indicate the intensity of the storm, when it was identified. Um, and then we also have information here on the info tag there. And it tells you where that data came from. And we also have it for, of course, all of our satellite layers as well. Because typically, when you start visualizing data, you can't just visualize it straight from the data. You have to apply flags. Sometimes you need to do some filtering or smoothing. And this tells you all the processing steps that occurred. And so here we have ocean speed. And so let's say you came to SOTO first and saw if data was available. It can take you straight back to the data set information page, which I have been demoing earlier. 
So this should be somewhat familiar to um, the viewers now. Because so now this is another way to access our data. You can visualize it first and then decide, oh, this is what I'm interested in, and then come back and still be able to access all the data. So now we have all the WINS layers available. But let's say, oh, and it zooms. And you also have this really nice um, information bar up here to let you know that if it's actually processing or if you know it's just um, whether it's thinking or if it's just you know done and nothing's being rendered. So it's kind of a nice way of no, notifying the user on what's happening. Okay, so I can also turn off layers. There's a little X. So you can either toggle it off here. I can turn that off there. Or I can also um, turn it off with the layers on the right by Xing out. Now let's say I wanted to see, because as you can see, Hurricane Patricia intensified pretty quickly here. I want to see what the sea surface temperature was that could feed it. So now you see infrared microwave blended. I'm going to choose blended because only because blended gives a good picture. Let's go and zoom out a little bit. And as you see now, surface temperature is the top layer, so you're no longer able to see the vectors. And we'll just change that. And we'll have to go and there you go. So now you can see here's the color bar, of course, which you can toggle between Celsius and Fahrenheit. And you can see it was fairly warm in the area. And we also have temperature anomaly, so you can see exactly how much warmer than normal it was. So now you can see these are the winds. Um, these are also the cloud conditions, so you can, it's, which is a better you know, image for seeing hurricanes. And also, was the water warmer than typical? And of course, since we have the temperature anomalies up, you can also see the setting El Nino that's coming up, which is pretty huge, along with these warm blobs that have been happening off the um, western US that have been kind of wreaking havoc with the um, local ecology as well because of the warm waters. Okay. So next we'll go on to subsetting. So we have uh, two tools at Hodak that can help you deal with subsetting. So they are high tide and last. High tide is a level two long track subsetter that allows you to um, basically look at the individual granules along with um, the uh, data sets, regions, and such, along with, um, and then we also have LAS, um, which is our going to deal with gridded and um, level three, level four data. So for the interest of time, we're just going to do a quick overview, um, not an actual live demo, of high tide and LAS. So here you can see, here's high tide. And of course, you can always go back to our web portal and go to the data access tab. And it has links to all of our tools. So here you can see we have a screenshot of high tide. Um, this is OSTM, which is also known as JSON2, um, altimetry data, GDR, which is the historical uh, research process data. And on this image, you can see the orange lines, which represent the footprint. Um, as you can see, OSTM has a very, very narrow footprint. And here's the data without the footprint. I mean, this is only about 11 kilometers, so it's not very large. And then here you see the image variable. So what's being displayed is sea surface height anomalies. Uh, and you can also if, click on the view legends, which would give you the color bar for it. So here you can choose what specific region. We have predefined regions. You can also always draw in your own region with the square box and uh, subset, or you can always type it in. And then there's also the date range. So here on the uh, box, we always give you the start and end date. So you, can, so you won't put parameters that are outside of the data set's um, characteristics. And then after you input those two things, um, this, otherwise the default is going to be global and for the full time series, which is going to be a lot of data because this is giving you granule by granule. And for OSTM, it's 254 files per 10 days, so it's a lot. 
So here you'll see, um, you'll get a granule listing, start time, end time. You can choose which ones, and then those will be the ones visualized. And you can also um, download in, in NetCDF or um, HDF. And you also can um, download selected or download all. If you choose download all, you'll get a prompt for um, your email address because it'll take a while for it to run, if you, especially if you're trying to do almost the full time series for a subsetted area, just because it's a lot of files that you have to go through. So then you'll receive an email back saying that the job is ready for you to download. OK, next is LAS. And LAS is, um, I'm sure some other users are familiar with LAS. It's actually developed by NOAA. It's a tool um, that various data centers and DACs have implemented at their own local um, areas, because you can kind of tweak it for your own data sets. So here we have um, LAS for the reconstructed data set uh, for sea surface height. And so you can choose the data set here, of course. And then you would, um, and also it's always nice to do the update plot button here so that it'll refresh itself so you don't have to keep doing it uh, manually. And then, of course, you have your regional map so you can pan or you can uh, draw the box. Or you can always put the location in manually. And of course, choose between latitude, longitude, or Hofmuller plots, or a time series. So here you can see, as choose data sets, uh, an example of data sets available in LAS, and also how you can uh, drill down to the individual variables. Here we have the Save As, and the Save As will actually allow you to pick from several different formats. Um, including uh, ArcGrid, which is kind of a GIS-friendly data set, but of course it's proprietary with Arc um, Esri. So, uh, but for those who are GIS users, there is an option, as we don't have as most of our data sets are HDF or NetCDF, and of course the start and end time. And then you can also export it as an XML into Google Earth. Um, export it the desktop application so you can save your settings, share it with um, other collaborators. And then there's also this uh, compare box, which is really nice. Unfortunately, we don't have a screenshot of that. But basically, you can have four to six different boxes of various parameters showing different dates and regions, and also flipping between latitude, longitude maps, and Hofmuller, and the time series. So you can kind of get a uh, full view of what's going on. So those are our subsetters. And of course, um, if you have questions, you can always visit our forum. Uh, you, of course, need to have a URS account if you want to post. But everyone in the world can view. So if you, are, so if you have a URS access account through any of the DACs, it's the user registration accounts. Um, it's the same URS for all of the DACs. So if you have it uh, for, let's say you did it through Ornal, it'll be the same account through PODAC. And there's always our help desk. And of course, the web portal uh, has all the information, but sometimes it can be always be a bit too much. And you can always find out what the latest and greatest is going on on Facebook. And as I said before, we have lots of really great animations. And please look at them on YouTube. And I will turn it back over to Jennifer. OK, thank you, Jessica. Thanks, everybody. So what we'll do next is we are going to move to the final set of polling questions. I'll give these questions probably two minutes or so. And from there, we will move to our Q&A period. So for those of you who are interested in participating in the Q&A period, please be sure to stay in the meeting room and or stay on the line. All right, so we'll give these just a couple of minutes, and then we'll move to the Q&A. All right, thanks, everybody.
All right, everybody, we've got just a few more seconds here, and then we'll move directly to the excuse me, Q&A period. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move along to the Q&A period here. That We do have a question from earlier, but before we address those, I wanted to say just a few thanks to all of you. <clears throat> so in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, for those of you who are interested in downloading the presentation, you see both the agenda as well as the PowerPoint. So if you were to left-click on the presentation, uh, you would then be prompted to download that presentation. And you could do that now if you're interested, but I'll also leave the meeting room open for an additional 10 minutes once we're finished uh, with the Q&A period, so you could also do it later. Um, as mentioned earlier, this webinar was recorded. It will be posted both to our YouTube channel and Google+. You would search for NASA Earth Data. I'll also post it to our online catalog, the URL to the left, the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar. Um, the file share pod is persistent only on the online catalog. Um, so if you scroll to the end of the webinar, you would still be able to download the files um, at a later date if you're interested, okay? All right, so let's move to the first question. Um, I've got to find that here. Uh, okay, so the first question was, is there any free read software for NetCDF3 or NetCDF4 SST files? So either Michelle or Jessica. So um, yes, we do have a free read software. So one of the things you can do is go on the forum, and we have um, some data recipes there with some software. If you also go on the OpenDAP or FTP links with the data, you'll see a um, SW folder which contains software. So uh, we have placed generic NetCDF readers with our NetCDF data sets. Um, written in MATLAB, IDL, um, Python, and R for most of them uh, that you can access. It'll read uh, basically any well-formatted NetCDF file, uh, not just specifically for that single data set, unless it has an odd format. OK, thank you, Jessica. So right now, I don't see further questions. There must be some additional questions here. Let's take a look here. Oh, Jennifer, I was also going to say um, for NetCDF and HDF, there's also this tool called Panoply that was developed at Goddard, which is also a visualizing tool. You have to download the software. It's an uh, application yeah. that runs on your computer. But it does a really good job at um, visualizing the software, and you can also export the data into a CSV file, I believe. So for everybody who's listening in, I can actually um, type in a link to that once we're, once we're finished here. Okay, I'll put it into the Q&A pod, and I could also send that information out uh, to all participants and registrants for the webinar as well. Any additional, qu okay, here we go. Sure, you're quite welcome. Um, so the next question is, if I were trying to download sea surface temperature data to use in GIS, how would I do this? So if you're using a GIS application, I would suggest that you choose a level three or level four data set. Uh, it also depends on which uh, GIS application you're using. I know that they can read NetCDF files, but some do a better job at it than others. We currently do not have um, any GeoTIFF formatted data for sea surface temperature. Uh, you can use LAS, which will convert it into a um, ARC uh, grid, but only if you're using the um, ArcGIS uh, application. Uh, you can also use, um, if you dig into threads, when you look at the data set, there's also an application called Godiva, and Godiva can also do data formats for you as well. I didn't demo that as it's part of the um, thread server protocol. But if you drill into uh, threads and into an individual data set, you be, should be able to see a link for Godiva that would be able to do some of the data reformat. Okay, thank you, Jessica. 
So the next is actually more of a comment. The, the comment is, the high tide server seems to be down daily for maintenance. Is this a permanent scenario? Uh, yes, for the time being, we are, we are working on a new software delivery and hoping to be able to avoid that. So I'll, I'll speak to that real quick, going beyond. So uh, right now, our current high tide, we, when we released it, it had a subset of data. And during that, it was more of, I would say, a beta product. So we realized that from the users, um, you all had an inherent need for something like that. So what we're doing right now is taking the next step and creating the next generation high tide. Um, so stay tuned. There's going to be a better and more improved, more improved functionalities, uh, quicker, to say the least, um, and with a whole slew of data sets, more so than what we have right now. So currently, yes, high tide is a little bit limited, and we are constantly going in and, and fixing things that we are realizing uh, break. But stay tuned. Uh, there is going to be a much more improved version. And we are watching it daily to make sure that everything is going smoothly for when you actually do access it at present. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and then there was also an additional point, uh, getting back to a question and comment uh, made earlier uh, from another data engineer out at Podak. And he said, would like to note that ArcGIS software now supports NetCDF formatted data files. Um, so that's something additional. Thank you, David. Well, and I would like to say a little bit more about the um, ArcGIS. It's great to know that there is a need from our user community, because clearly uh, what NASA provides for the most part is NetCF and HGF, but it's good to know what our users are going towards so that we can try and also change to accommodate. So thank you for that feedback on the ArcGIS. We might actually try and start going in that format as well. OK, wonderful. Thank you. So the next question is, can you recommend a software that runs on Linux, Ubuntu, that can convert HDF to NetCDF? So part of it's going to depend on what version of HDF and NetCDF you're talking about, because the latest version that's HDF5 and NetCDF4, um, Unidata and the HDF group actually got together to do that format. So in some cases, HDF5 and NetCDF4 are actually almost the same format. There's just um, a little bit uh, difference with some of the naming conventions. But I mean, they're basically the same format. Now, if you're talking about NetCDF3 and HDF4, that's a different story. Um, I would use um, something like uh, there's NCO and um, NC Tools, I believe. Uh, if you go to Unidata's website, you can find out information on those. Uh, and of course, HDF is not backwards compatible, so you need to make sure you have the right, right libraries installed uh, in order to read the data and do the conversions. OK, thank you, Jessica. So the next comment is, we have already read the ocean color data with ArcGIS, but it did not work for sea surface temperature net CDF3 files. Um, I think, yeah, I think that might be an issue because it's net CDF3. I know that um, if it isn't formatted, the metadata is not formatted in a certain way, especially if you're trying to use level two data. Level 2 data really isn't going to work in ArcGIS. You have to make sure that you're using gridded level 3 or level 4 data. Um, part of that is because there's really no projection information in the NetCDF level 2 data, and GIS relies on some of that uh, if you're doing a long track information. OK, thank you, Jessica. The next question is, anything to work out geostrophic currents from sea surface height? So we already have a data set that does, uh, well, it's, we have OSCAR, which is geostrophic plus thermal winds added into it. So it's Ekman and geostrophic. Some of the, um, and for the new, there is a newer version of OSCAR that is going to come out next year sometime that's actually going to separate out the Ekman and the geostrophic components. So if you just want geostrophic, you can, OSCAR will have all of that. Um, Otherwise, you're going to have to calculate it yourself and back out the Ekman component. 
or there are other data sets that are available. Um, Podak, of course, is one of the big distributors um, for altimetry uh, for the U.S. NASA missions, which, of course, Jason and Topex. Uh, we also have a counterpart at CNES, which is the French Space Agency, who are the partners of Jason and Topex. And their data center is called Aviso. Um, they also have um, geostrophic uh, current data as well. Okay, thank you, Jessica. All right. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. See so you making a comment, not a question, but good presentation. I anticipate using the macro level information rather than the granular data pack. All right, well, thank you. Are there any further questions? I'll give it just a minute here. Um, again, in the meanwhile, we will leave the room open for an additional 10 minutes. If you think of something, feel free to type that into the Q&A pod. Um, or download the presentations. Um, but after we finish the Q&A, we will log off from the telecon so you won't hear audio any longer. Okay, let's see here. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Michelle has posted a link to the Oscar um, data product that was mentioned just a moment ago. And this was for um, Lisa. Any further questions, anybody? Well, I would like to thank all of you for attending today. We were glad to have you. Again, within a couple of days, I should have the presentation, uh, the recording posted both to the online uh, catalog, which you see here on the left at the Earth Data webinar tiny URL link, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. All right. Looks like there are no further questions. Well, thanks, Jessica, and thanks, Michelle. At this point, we will log off from the telecon if there are no further questions, and I don't see. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now.